Hey, I'm Brandon, the online campus pastor here at Big Valley Grace, and thank you for taking a moment to watch this message. It is the teaching portion from one of our live weekend worship gatherings, and we have those every single weekend here online and in person, and I just want to extend an invitation to you to join us. We're just a local church, local body of believers, and we would love if you would join us uh, on a weekend upcoming here sometime soon. Uh, but as we get headed into this message together, a couple things just want to point you to. One is a connect card. If there's any way that, that we can pray for you, if you want to contact us, that connect card form is just a really great way uh, to let us know that you're joining us. Any next steps you want to take, stuff like that is right on there. Also, if you want to bring an offering, a worshipful gift uh, to King Jesus, you can do that right on our give page on our website or via text. So hope you enjoy the unpacking, the unfolding of the word as we look at it together. Morning. Morning. He is risen. He is risen. Man, isn't it good to come and worship Jesus Christ, to celebrate Jesus Christ? This is the historical, biblical events on our calendar where we remember that Jesus Christ is alive, that he has been resurrected from the dead, and he has brought hope, the hope of the gospel, the hope of us placing our faith in Jesus Christ and in his blood, his sacrifice on the cross that we might have eternal salvation. And it is wonderful to celebrate Jesus. And I'm glad that you're here. And I'm glad that I'm here. I'm glad that we're here together. If it is your very first time at Big Valley Grace Community Church, we wanna say welcome. We're so glad that you're here. In fact, I know there's a bunch of new people here. In fact, we got a whole row from Grand Canyon University back there, which is awesome. All right. Because everybody I know wants to go vacation in Modesto from Arizona. That's awesome. <laughs> this is a wonderful place. Welcome to the Modesto campus, to the worship center. We're so glad that you're here. Welcome to everybody who's joining us online right now. This is a great day to worship Jesus, and we're glad that you're here. Maybe you came with a friend, family member. Maybe a neighbor brought you. We're so glad that you're here. And if it is your first time, don't forget, go out to the information booth right out in the lobby. We got a gift for you. And we're really glad that you're here. We're so glad that you're with us today. So when Jesus gives the hope of the gospel, he is making a promise to us that he is going to fulfill that as we place our faith in him, we might have salvation. And promises that God makes are a big deal. God is a good promise maker and he's a good promise keeper. And so I went to a cultural authority to see a little bit about the promises of God. Amazon. So I went to Amazon and I typed in promises of God. There are over 9,000 products on Amazon that come up with the phrase promises of God. Apparently that's a big deal in our culture. So I went to the next authority in line, the Google, and I typed in promises of God. 561 million results came up when I typed in promises of God. And the best part is 10,600,000 of them were tattoos. <laughs> Clearly promises of God is a big deal in our culture. But here's the problem. The products on Amazon need a warranty. The results on Google get updated every second. They keep changing. And maybe the saddest part, tattoos fade. <laughs> Skin gets a, not as pristine as it used to be. So I thought, what's the solution? Where is there a location where we could find all of the promises of God? Where moth and rust do not destroy. Where thieves do not break in and steal where the truth will always remain. And it's right here. It's the word of God. It's the Bible. Everything good that I have to share with you today is from this book. It is from the Bible, where we find all, every one of the lasting and true promises of God that he makes and he keeps. There's two promises that I wanna share with you today. The first one is incredibly popular. It is quite likely you have heard this promise before. It is the most popular promise in the Bible, most likely. And it's in John chapter three, verse 16 and 17. 
It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. This is a very popular promise in the Bible because this verse explains, in a nutshell, really the story, the greatest story in the history of mankind. This verse shows the danger in the word perish, and that's perishing from our sin. This verse shows the alternative outcome, have eternal life. This verse shows the hero, God and the Son. This verse shows the solution, whoever believes in him. This verse shows the hope for the future. Be saved through him. It's a very popular verse in the Bible. And we can see why. Because this verse helps us understand the greatest story that has ever happened. The second promise that I want to share with you, it's not so popular. In fact, even as I share this promise, it is quite likely that you may have never heard it. And it's quite likely you may not recognize it as a promise. And this promise comes from Mark chapter 14, verse 27. And Jesus said to them, you will all fall away. You will all fall away. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. The you in this verse is referring to Jesus' disciples. Those were the people he was speaking to. These disciples had been with Jesus for about three years. They ate together with Jesus. They traveled together with Jesus. They shared life together with Jesus. Yet Jesus could see that as he was heading to the cross, which is what we celebrate on the calendar at Good Friday, it's Jesus going to the cross to die for our sin. As he was heading to the cross, he could see that in that difficult moment of incredible torment, pain, suffering, that these disciples would leave him. Not exactly a very encouraging promise. You will all fall away. You know, I did not find any products on Amazon that were titled, You Will All Fall Away. In fact, when I put in, You Will All Fall Away into Amazon, do you know what I got? Oh, the places you'll go by Dr. Seuss. (laughs) Not exactly a connection here. When I typed into Google, You Will All Fall Away tattoos, I didn't see any tattoos that came up that said, you will all fall away. I saw some very depressing tattoos. We should really invite these people to church. (laughs) We should welcome them to come and to know Jesus. You will all fall away. It's a promise of failure. It's a promise of forcible harm. Strike the shepherd. It's a promise that is frantic. The sheep will be scattered. But here's the great news. That's only half the promise because there's a verse that comes right after it so that we can see the whole promise. And in Mark 14, 27 and 28, it says this, and Jesus said to them, you will all fall away for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Often we can easily recognize the themes of the first part of this promise in our lives. Themes of failure, themes of not making it, themes of not cutting it. And we can focus right there. And oftentimes we can miss the themes in the second part of this promise. The themes of hope and redemption. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Even though we betray God, fall away from God, turn our backs on God... Everything changes when the but, B-U-T, of God shows up onto the scene. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. When Jesus says, after I'm raised up, he is declaring ahead of time that he is going to rise from the, the grave. He is sharing the promise of the resurrection, but after I'm raised up, he is telling his disciples, I am going to be alive again. This is the promise of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, but after I'm raised up. And then he simply says this, I will go before you. I will go 
before you. The disciples Jesus was speaking to were Jewish. And in their cultural, historical backdrop, they would have heard a significance to what Jesus is speaking about throughout the history of the nation of Israel. Stories of enslavement, stories of enemies, stories of war, stories of a great hero, things that they had been told since their childhood would come to their mind. I want to share with you some examples of those from the Old Testament. In Exodus chapter 13, 21 and 22, it says, and the Lord went before them. Remember, Jesus said, I will go before you. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them along the way and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light that they might travel by day and by night. The pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night did not depart from the people. God promised to lead the people of Israel by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And he was always with them. Here's another example. Exodus 14, 19 and 20. And the angel of God was going before the host of Israel. The angel of God is going before the host of Israel. Host referring to the term army. So the army of Israel. The whole group of Israel. The angel of God was going before the host of Israel. Moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them. Coming between the host of Egypt... And the host of Israel. So the armies of Egypt are now pursuing everyone in Israel. And God, who goes before them, now comes in and moves behind them and provides a protection, a separation for the people of Israel between them and the attacking army of Egypt. People of Israel knew. God said, he's going to go before us. Problem is, they got impatient They become uh, frustrated. They become unfaithful. And they go, God's taken too long. None of us can relate to anything like that. (laughs) And Moses goes up onto the mountain. And in Exodus 32, verse 1 and 24, we see what happened. We see what happens when the people of Israel, they just get a little impatient. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, Up! Make us gods who shall go before us. See, God had said, I will go before you. And they knew they needed someone to go before. Moses is taking too long. Make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Then, at the end of the chapter, Aaron is retelling the story, and this is the version he shares. So I said to them, let anyone who has gold take it off. So they gave it to me, and I threw it into the fire, and out came this calf. Look, my family does a whole lot of camping. We throw a lot of stuff in the fire. There's never been a calf that came jumping out of the fire. It's ridiculous what he's saying. God put up with the people of Israel who were impatient, unfaithful, tried to replace God with idols of gold. Another example, Deuteronomy 1, 29 and 33. Then I said to you, do not be in dread or afraid of them. And it's referring to the other nations. The Lord, your God, who goes before you, will himself fight for you. Just as he did for you in Egypt, before your eyes. And in the wilderness where you have seen the Lord, your God, who carried you, who carried you, As a man carries his son all the way that you went until you came to this place. Now, they struggled with obedience, just like we struggle with obedience to the Lord. Yet in spite of this word, you did not believe the Lord your God who went before you in the way to seek you out a place to pitch your tents in fire by night and in the cloud by day to show you by way you should go. God continued to restore the people of Israel like a good father who picks up his son and carries his son the rest of the way. This last week in my home, we were retelling the story 
of a certain Christmas. My fourth oldest son, we have nine children. I'll tell that story at another time. My fourth oldest son, we got him a skateboard for Christmas. And we live on the east side of town and there's a great park with a big ditch. And I said, come on, buddy, let's take our skateboards and let's go to the ditch. So we went to the ditch and we went to the top of the ditch and we got on our skateboards and we rode all the way down and it was awesome until the bottom. And my son fell and he crash landed at the bottom. So like a good loving father, I went and I picked my son up and I said, get back on your skateboard. And I made him skateboard all the way home. And yeah, he was crying and stuff, but it was okay. <laughs> and we got home and we said, all right, we got to get ready because we got this really exciting event we're going to go to tonight. And my son looked at me and my wife and said, I think I need to go to Kaiser. <laughs> it wasn't that bad of a break. <laughs> he was only in a cast for a couple months. It was in that moment that I realized I had made a huge mistake as a dad. God's not like that. God's not like that. Because this verse tells us that he picks up his son and he carries his son the rest of the way and enables his child to be successful. It's pretty incredible. In Deuteronomy 31, 3, it says, The Lord your God himself will go over before you. He will destroy these nations before you so that you shall dispossess them. And Joshua will go over at your head as the Lord has spoken. God literally cleared the way for the people of Israel. Cleared the nations out before them, removing their enemies. Here's the last example I'll share from the Old Testament. Then Moses summoned Joshua and said to him in the sight of all Israel, Be strong and courageous, for you shall go with this people into the land that the Lord has sworn to their fathers to give them, and you shall put them in possession of it. It is the Lord who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. God gives strength and courage to the people of Israel, to be unafraid, promising always to be with them. It's with this incredibly rich spiritual heritage and backdrop that the disciples heard Jesus share this unusual promise, the second promise that I shared with you. Let's look at it again. In Mark chapter 14, verse 27 and 28, it says this, and Jesus said to them, you will all fall away. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. See, the first part of this promise is very bitter. You will all fall away. And I want to give you an example of how it is bitter. Peter was like one of Jesus' best friends. He's like one of his best disciples. He hung out with Jesus while Jesus did his ministry. And Jesus gets arrested. And Jesus goes to a trial before the religious leaders. And what I'm about to read to you is what happens in the life of Peter while Jesus was getting arrested. It says, now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard and a servant girl came up to him and said, you also were with Jesus the Galilean. But he denied it before them all saying, I don't know what you mean. And he went out to the entrance. Another servant girl saw him and she said to the bystanders, this man was with Jesus of Nazareth. And again, he denied it with an oath. I do not know the man. After a little while, the bystanders came up and said, Peter, said to Peter, certainly you too are one of them. Your accent betrays you. Then he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know the man. And immediately, the rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the saying of Jesus, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. The bitterness of the recognition of his sin. 
Peter experienced the first half of this promise, you will all fall away. And he experienced the bitter taste of sin. In fact, all of us can relate to the bitter taste of sin. The Bible says that for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All means all. We are all included. And we all have moments in our life where we have tasted the bitterness of sin and it has caused us to weep bitterly, just like Peter did, as we recognize our own failures. But then comes an incredible moment in history, in biblical, factual history. It's the verified historical events of the week we are currently celebrating. Good Friday, two days ago. It's the day that Jesus died on the cross and he was placed in a tomb. A large rock was sealing the entrance of that tomb. And Good Friday had now passed, just like it's passed in our calendar this week. And then there was the Sabbath. And the Sabbath was Saturday. And it also has passed, just like the Sabbath has passed in our calendar this week. And then we come to early Sunday morning, and we had an incredible time out in the back parking lot with a sunrise service this morning. It was really, really cool to gather to worship Jesus very early in the morning. And it was very early on Sunday morning, and in the story of Jesus, we find three women. And the three women went to the tomb of Jesus to continue the process of preparing the body of Jesus for burial. And as they approach the tomb, they're considering, how are we going to move this enormous stone? Because they thought, we're not going to be able to do that on our own. And when they get to the tomb, they see that the stone had been rolled away, and there is an angel there, and they are terrified. Because every time in the Bible an angel shows up, the people who see the angel are terrified. And if you and I saw an angel, we'd be freaking out too. Which is why the first thing that comes from God to speak to people who have seen an angel is, do not be alarmed. (laughs) Because people are alarmed when they come face to face with God and his people. Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him? But go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you. Remember what Jesus said? I will go before you. He is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. This is incredible. Why does this matter? This matters because sin is bitter and the cross is bitter and the tomb is bitter and death is bitter but Jesus says after I'm raised up I will go before you to Galilee and the angel of the Lord says he has risen he's not here see the place where they laid him but go and tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee there you will see him just as he told you the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the hope of the gospel and where sin is bitter and the cross is bitter and the tomb is bitter and death is bitter the resurrection of Jesus Christ is so sweet the resurrection of Jesus Christ is so sweet and Jesus goes before us into the newness of resurrection life When we come to these moments every year, what are we doing? The church is reminded about the sweetness of the resurrection and the world is invited to the sweetness of the resurrection. God who goes before us, Jesus who goes before us into resurrection life. Jesus Christ is alive. And he has gone before us into resurrection life. And we have the opportunity to follow him into resurrection life. In Romans, it says this. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. 
For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. In other words, Jesus goes before us into new life. He's the firstborn among many brothers and many brothers in that term, it represents all of the church, men and women, boys and girls, all who place their life in Jesus. And those whom he predestined, he also called and those whom he also called, he also justified and those whom he justified, he also glorified. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the specific action of the Son of God going before us into the newness of resurrection life. This is the story of the gospel. This is why we celebrate. This is the historical, biblical significance of why we have gathered right now. We celebrate the risen, resurrected Jesus Christ. We worship Jesus who is alive right now. We worship Jesus who is alive. The gospel in a nutshell is this. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. That Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. Good Friday. That he was buried in the tomb over the Sabbath, over the Saturday. And he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. That was Sunday. And that he appeared to Cephas, and that's Peter, that's another name for Peter. Then to the 12, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom still are alive, though some have fallen asleep. And those who have fallen asleep means at the time they wrote it, they had already died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, last of all, as to one untimely born, he also appeared to me. Paul is the one who's writing it. For I'm the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. Paul actually killed Christians. But... By the grace of God. And that is such an important phrase. By the grace of God, I am what I am. Amen. And his grace towards me was not in vain. It is because of the grace of God. God giving us his grace that we can enter into the resurrection life when we place our faith in Jesus Christ in the blood of the cross trusting Jesus for the forgiveness of our sin. 1 Corinthians 15, 20 and 23, it says, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, and by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, and it's speaking of Adam and Eve, it's, it's referring to the first sin, Adam, so also in Christ shall all be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ the first fruits. Jesus said, I will go before you. Christ the first fruits. He's the first one to experience resurrection life. Then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. And that's the hope that we have, that we will experience resurrection life as we follow Jesus Christ. Christ experienced the resurrection first, then through faith in the blood of Jesus Christ, we experience resurrection life also. The resurrection life that Jesus has is available to us in the resurrected Jesus Christ. Now, I've shared with you two promises. The first one's super popular. Second one's not so popular because the first half of it is super bitter. The second half is very sweet, but it's not as popular of a promise. And I've shared those two promises with you. But I want to share one more promise with you. We'll call this a bonus promise. And the reason I want to share with you is because I don't know what's in your Amazon shopping cart. But the promise I'm about to share with you is what you're actually looking for. I don't know what it is you're typing in to Google the search. But the promise I'm about to share with you is what you're actually searching for. In fact, I don't have a clue what all your tattoos are. But the promise you're looking for, what you're looking for, is this promise. And this comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 14, one through three. Let not your hearts be troubled. It might be that some who are here today, there is so much trouble going on in your life right now, the only thing you can think about is the trouble that you have going on. And I have great news for you, because the message of Jesus Christ is simply this. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. 
believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. He's referring to God the Father in heaven. He's referring to a house in heaven, rooms that are in heaven. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? Remember, Jesus said, I'm going to go before you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself that where I am, you may also be. Jesus said, I will go before you. And if I go before you to my Father God in heaven where he has a house with many rooms and if I'm preparing rooms for you, I'm going to come back to get you that where I am, you may also be. See, because after Jesus was resurrected from the dead, he appeared to a bunch of people, and then an event called the Ascension took place, where Jesus ascended back to the Father in heaven, where Jesus now rules and reigns. As Savior God, creator of the world, he is ruling and reigning in the throne room in heaven, and he's saying, I'm getting your room ready for you. And if I go before you to get your room ready for you, I'm going to come again. And I will take you to myself, that where I am, you may also be. Why? Why would he do this? Well, I think the last phrase in this passage helps us see it. It is simply that where I am, you may be also. This phrase right here helps us understand that Jesus wants us to be with him. God wants us to be with him. God actually wants to be in relationship with us. Jesus wants to be in relationship with us, that where I am, you may be also. It is the desire of Jesus that we would be with him. It's the desire of Jesus we would be with him in heaven. It's incredible. It's a statement of relationship. It's a statement of promise that God wants us to be with him. And you might be going, why? Why would God want us to be with him? I want to share with you again the first promise that I shared. Because it's at the beginning of this first promise that we see why would God want us to be with him. Because in John 3, 16, it starts by saying this, for God so loved the world. For God so loved you. And God so loved you. And God so loved you. And God so loved you. For God so loved us that he gave his only son, Jesus Christ, that whoever believes in him should not perish. And that would be perishing from our sin. But they would have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Jesus said, I will go before you. And he has done this, the motivation for why he has done this is because of love. God loves you. God loves you. Like God really loves you. Like God loves you so much, he's willing to forgive you of your sin as you place your faith in him for the forgiveness of your sins. And you know how that's proof that God loves you so much? Because everyone who's here, we know people who are unwilling to forgive us of our sin. But God's not like that. God forgives us of our sin as we come to him and we ask him forgiveness because for God so loved the world. He loves us. He loves you. The first half of that second promise is incredibly bitter for all will fall away and all of us can recognize that bitterness in our life where we walk away. But God does a transformational work through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And God takes situations that are all bitter. And through the resurrection, God can make our life sweet. God takes the bitter and he works with the bitter and he moves us to a place where it's sweet. The sweetness of the love of God being poured into our lives. It's incredible to be loved by God. God goes before us. Jesus said, I will go before you. And God has gone before us. 
He has gone before us to prepare a place for us in heaven. And I want to encourage us. We're going to have a time of prayer. And the time of prayer is going to have some music with no lyrics. And we're not done yet. Our service isn't done, but we're going to take a moment to have prayer. And I want to encourage you during this time of prayer to do something. I want to encourage you to utilize this card, this Connect card. They're located in the seat pocket in front of you. I'd encourage you to fill it out. On the back of this card, I would encourage you to pray through the back of the card. And here's why. It might be that God is stirring some things up in your life right now. And it might be that you're recognizing that you need to place your faith in the blood of Jesus Christ, that you might have salvation from your sin. And you're recognizing God has gone before you into heaven and you want to follow him. You want to trust in Jesus Christ. There's a place on the back. It says, my decision. It says, today I received Christ as my Lord and Savior for the first time. And during this time of prayer, maybe God's going to have you check that box. Because maybe today's going to be the day that in prayer, you're going to place your faith in Jesus. It might be as you're praying, you're recognizing, you know what? I kind of have like walked away. I've been wandering. I've been getting sidetracked. And today's a day that I need to come back to the love of God. I need to be refreshed in the love of God. I need to freshly ask for forgiveness for my sins. And it might be you need to recommit your life to the Lord today. There's another thing that says, today I responded and reaffirmed, renewed my relationship with Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And it might be during this time of prayer you're going to check that. It might be, as you saw 31 children who were baptized this week, or those who were baptized in our service today, that you're recognizing, I'm a follower of Jesus. I've never been baptized. I need to be baptized. Well, it might be during the time of prayer, you're going to say, okay, I'm going to be baptized. It might be, you've been coming to church here, and you love coming to church here, and you're recognizing, you know what, I think it's time to like commit to be a part of this church family. Like, I need to be a part of this church family. I need a church family. I need a church family to commit to me, and I need to commit to my church family. And you might say, you know what, I'd like to become a member. It might be that during this time of prayer, you're going to write down a prayer request. I don't know how God will use this tool in your life, how he's going to use his word in your life during this time of prayer, but I'm trusting that he's working. You see, if God doesn't work, no work happens. It's only the work of God that matters. And I'm trusting that God is going to be at work. And so we're going to have some time of prayer. After the time of prayer, I'm going to invite a team to collect all these cards. So we're going to collect these cards after the time of prayer. And everyone who turns in a card, I'm going to invite to an event that I'm going to do. It's an event. We're going to, it'll be in the evening. We'll have dessert together, myself and our team. We're going to share about the ministry uh, of Big Valley Grace, and we're going to help people take next steps. Whatever the next steps, whatever it is that God's doing in your life, however it is you're praying, we're going to invite you to this night, and we're going to spend time with you, and we're going to just help you take a next step. It's going to be a really awesome time. All you need to do is turn in the card, and I'm going to send you a letter. You turn in this card... I will send you a letter to this dessert and then you can RSVP for that night and I would love to spend time with you hanging out and we'll talk about what God's doing in your life. So let's spend some time praying during this next song and I just really encourage you to take this moment serious. You and the Lord. God can hear you as you talk to him and so as you take this time to be in prayer, God will hear what you pray. And I would encourage you to spend that time, just you and the Lord, praying. So let's enter into a time of prayer now.
Father God, Lord, thank you. Thank you that you go before us. Thank you that you prepare the way. Thank you that you prepare a place. You, you, you provide the solution. God, thank you that you have made your son, Jesus Christ, the resurrected Savior who saves us from our own sin. And God, as we're spending time praying, I'm trusting, God, you're, you're at work in people's lives. That's what I'm praying for. I'm praying for you to be at work in our lives, my life, our lives, together. Lord, and it might be that, that during this time you're reminding people about the sweetness of the resurrection. And God, I pray that that encouragement would really be powerful in our lives. God, it might be that you're inviting people to you for the first time to trust their faith in you, to put their faith in you, to trust in Jesus Christ and his blood for the forgiveness of their sin. And God, I want to say thank you. Thank you for inviting us to you. And Lord, if you're not working, no work has happened. And so we want to say thank you for how you're working. Lord, thank you for being a God who's at work in our midst. You're working in our lives. You're working in our families. You're working in our fellowship here. And God, everything we do, we want to do to honor you. And so we say thank you, Jesus. Thank you for being our Savior. Thank you for being our God. Thank you for forgiving us. Thank you for loving us. And thank you, thank you for being our God who goes before us. And we pray this in the name of Jesus and all God's family said, amen.